It's Sunday just after the 2022 Melbourne Grand Prix, and this is what Max Verstappen has to say. We're already miles behind, and I don't even want to think about the championship fight at the moment. I think it's more important to finish races. It's race number three, and the Red Bull season looks like this. We've got a Bahrain double DNF. In Jeddah, Perez got pole position, and Verstappen won the race. And then in Melbourne, Verstappen DNFs. How do we go from this to Max Verstappen alone almost beating Ferrari and Mercedes in the constructors? Now, the big question that I'm asking myself is, What's so special about the RB18? I mean, is it just the car or is it the drivers or something else? Speaking of domination, Verstappen could actually take some pretty big records away from both Michael Schumacher and Sebastian Vettel, but I'll get back to those in just a minute. In this video, we're going to have a look at some data and try to explain exactly why the RB18 appears to be so dominant. So let's get into it. For starters, I want to say that the RB18 is a much different Red Bull than the Red Bull that we're used to over the past couple of years. It's not really normal to see a Red Bull all the way up at the top of the speed traps, but they've been there almost the entire season. And why is that? First, the Honda or Red Bull powertrain's power unit is probably one of the best units on the grid right now. From a data point of view, it's actually very difficult to separate aerodynamic drag from engine power. At every track that we've been to, the Honda and especially the Red Bull team are at the top of the speed traps. If we compare the Red Bull qualifying top speeds to the field average, they're usually substantially faster than everybody else. Now, the trend that we tend to notice is the circuits where you need a bit more downforce, that top speed delta reduces completely and Red Bull are just in line with the field average. But as long as it's not a super high downforce circuit, Red Bulls have about a six kilometer an hour advantage relative to the field average. Now, I know what you're going to say. You've looked at this chart and you notice I just said at the high downforce circuits, the delta is almost zero. And then you see at Monza, the lowest downforce circuit on the calendar, the Red Bulls were actually slower in a straight line than the average. And there's something super interesting about this, but I'm going to come back to that in just a second. So we've talked about the engine power, but what is it about the RB18 that makes it so different from its predecessors? In the past, everyone got really used to the Red Bull cars being these like high rake, not so fast in a straight line, but downforce generating machines. Now, the high rake philosophy was one that helped generate more downforce with the underbody of the car, which was an Adrian Newey kind of specialty. But one of the big downsides of the high rake philosophy is that it produces quite a bit more drag. It's actually very difficult to have an efficient or low drag, but high rake car. Because of the aerodynamic regulations, the new underbodies of these cars generate quite a bit more downforce, and you don't need that high rake to generate efficient, clean downforce. Actually, they found out that they don't need to have the most downforce in order to be the fastest. Let's have a look at some of the data from the few recent qualifying sessions. The first track we're going to have a look at is Zandvoort. This is a high downforce circuit with a strong emphasis on cornering performance and grip. Engine power and drag are important here, but not as much as places like Baku, Monza, or Spa. Verstappen takes pole over Leclerc by only a few hundredths of a second. But when we actually start looking at the data, we're going to realize that both Red Bull and Ferrari are finding lap time in very different ways. Looking at the lap, at one point, Leclerc was over half a second up on Verstappen. Not exactly what you think of when you think of them finishing within a couple of hundreds of each other. So to explain this, let's have a look at the overlay between the drivers and qualifying. Here we've got Verstappen in blue and Leclerc in red. So the left side of the chart is the start of the lap. The right side of the chart is the end of the lap. And for the most part, we're just going to be looking at the car speed here, which is the top trace. Now, the first thing that stands out to me when looking at this is just the top speed. We can see Verstappen is much faster here for turn one and a lot faster going into turn 11. However, on the downside of that, the Red Bull's actually losing quite a bit of time and speed through these corners. You can see their apex speeds are lower than the Ferrari. So looking through the lap, you know, the Ferrari's faster at the start of the lap. The Red Bull's actually losing quite a bit of time in turn seven and turn eight. And then they start to claw a little bit of lap time back towards the end of the lap. The whole idea of like being faster on the straights and slower through the corners tells you that Red Bull car probably has a bit less rear wing or in general, they have less downforce and less drag than the Ferrari. Now, another very interesting thing about this lap is that the Ferrari starts off quite strong and, you know, by the middle of the lap, they're almost half a second up on the Red Bulls, but they start to lose time through the end of the lap. Now, this could be a very interesting indication. It's possible that the Ferrari actually has higher rear tire temperature evolution. So, you know, at the start of the lap, they're in a good window. And by the end of the lap, the Ferrari is losing grip. And we'll come back to that. One of the things that jumps out to me also is the Red Bulls traction. They appear to have better traction through throughout most of the lap. You can see, especially out of the low speed corners, they're able to go on the throttle earlier, more confidently, and they hit full throttle sooner. 
As we've seen in the last few races, the Red Bull appears to be very good on their rear tires. And that's one thing that we've seen Ferrari tending to struggle with lately. Traction out of low speed corners is actually a first order factor concerning tire management and degradation management. So this definitely looks like it's a strength of the RB18. Now, if we go back to the data, the Ferrari have one standout characteristic that we've seen all season. Looking at how late they come off of the throttle in most of the strong braking sections, you can see that the Ferrari is absolutely monstrous on the brakes. They can almost always through all the tracks I've looked at this season break later and harder than Red Bull. Now, this doesn't just mean that they can break harder in a straight line. In order to break later and harder, you have to be able to carry that speed through the corner. So you've got to have really good balance and grip on the late entry phase of the corner. Now, Ferrari does definitely have better braking, but could this whole compromise actually be hurting their traction and ultimately their race pace? So we've looked at a high downforce circuit and it's now time to look at the lowest downforce circuit of the year. Monza, aka the Temple of Speed. Now at Monza, you'll see teams doing anything possible to squeeze a few extra kilometers per hour out of their car. It's actually pretty normal here in qualifying to see the teammates taking turns giving each other a tow around the lap just to get a little bit more top speed out of their cars. Teams are running the skinniest rear wings possible and they have just enough downforce on their cars to get through the few medium speed corners on the track. That is unless you're Red Bull racing this year. Remember how I said the Red Bull was faster in the speed traps except for high downforce circuits? Well, here we are at the lowest downforce circuit of the year and we see Red Bull doing something completely different. Everybody have the flattest rear wings possible and Red Bull are running a rear wing with actually quite a bit of curvature. But why would they put more downforce and drag on their car when their main weapon all season has actually been straight line speed? Well, let's have a look at the data and see what we can make of this. Now, in this overlay, we've got Verstappen in blue and Leclerc in red again. This is Monza fastest laps from qualifying. It is very rare in 2022 to see the Red Bull slower than a Ferrari in a straight line. In this qualifying session, Leclerc outqualified Verstappen by all almost two whole tenths of a second. If you look at this chart, you can see when we've got the DRS on, the Red Bull and Ferrari are about the same speed in a straight line. But on the straights with the DRS off, the Ferrari is about 10 kilometers an hour faster than the Red Bull. Now this is actually a pretty good indication of how much more drag the Red Bull has to put on in order to match Ferrari through the corners. Notice here in these medium speed corners, the Red Bull is similar or faster than the Ferrari for once. But if we think back to Zandvoort, when Red Bull were a little bit faster in the straights, they actually had to give up quite a bit of time through the corners, but at Monza, they've done something different. Now, naturally, with more downforce, I would expect the Red Bull to have quite a bit better uh, traction. You can see here, exit of Lesmo 2, the car is much more planted. Exit of Ascari, they're much earlier on throttle. The final corner as well. And I think this is just a side effect of having more grip. In the second chicane here, Max looks like he's using the throttle a little bit to rotate the car, or he had a little bit of a mistake here. But you've got to think about this. Why would they do this? Why would they go slower in a straight line to make up speed through the corners? We still don't understand why the Red Bull decided to run more rear wing here. In the race, the Ferraris just didn't have the degradation or the pace to match the Red Bull, which has kind of been the norm since we came back from the summer break. The Red Bull traction looks strong, and maybe that extra bit of rear wing that they ran in Monza was exactly what they needed to keep the traction consistent and to keep the rear tires from overheating. After Spa and Monza, both the Ferrari drivers in the press were talking about rear tires overheating and tire overheating generally being a problem for them, so maybe Red Bull are up to something here. Now, we've looked at two very different different circuits and seeing that the Red Bull can kind of do a bit of everything, even if the approach they take isn't the obvious one for that circuit. It looks like this new Red Bull just has a big operating window. But if we take a step back, I feel like all the information that we've looked at so far says the Red Bull isn't actually dominant at all. To me, a dominant car is one that consistently outqualifies the rivals by several tenths and then just sails away from the competition during the races. If we want to talk about the outright performance of a car, I like to look at single lap pace. Ferrari have taken 10 out of 16 pole position so far this season. Red Bull only have five and George Russell has taken the remaining pole position in Hungary. Now, if we look at the gap to pole for the entire season for the top three teams, we can see that Ferrari is pretty much the fastest everywhere. The only time that Red Bull have actually put a substantial gap into Ferrari was at Belgium and they put quite a bit of gap into both Ferrari and Mercedes. Looking back through the rest of the season, either Red Bull are only marginally ahead of Ferrari or Ferrari have put, you know, 0.3, 0.4% into Red Bull, and it's kind of starting to change a little bit. Now, for me, it's kind of hard to say that Ferrari doesn't have the fastest car this season. Yeah, in terms of the championship, Ferrari have lost a lot of points to reliability, mistakes, and everything else. But if we go back and look at this, something's changed since the summer break. You know, Red Bull, big gap in Spa, barely got pole in Zandvoort. You know, and then we go to Monza, and then Red Bull tried something a little bit different, and actually they won that race despite being nowhere close to pole. So really, what is it making the RB18 so dominant in the races? We've mentioned the power unit and the 
the car, that only leaves us left to discuss the drivers. Now, if we had only been considering Checo's qualifying and race pace this year, I don't think we'd be having a discussion about an RB18 dominance. Earlier in the season, the team actually struggled to get enough front end in the car in the right places to make Max happy with the car. He was he was pretty vocal about this. Now, at the start of the season, Checo was very comfortable with this type of car, and the performance level compared to their competition was reasonable. I mean, Perez took pole position in Jetta and secured the coveted Monaco Grand Prix win. But through the season, the team does appear to have added some performance to the car to help with the weak front tires, and Perez seems to have fallen away a little bit. Now, if you read anything in the press, it sounds like Perez is getting destroyed this year, and I don't think that's necessarily the case. You can see at the start of the season, we're only talking about a few tenths of a percent between the two drivers in qualifying, with the exception of Spain and Austria. But since Hungary, Max appears to have found something else completely different with the car. His single lap pace gap to Perez is growing. Checo is an awesome driver with excellent racecraft and great tire management, but Max has been able to consistently get more performance out of the car this year in both qualifying and the race. So what is it exactly about Max? Clearly without such an adaptable, and well-rounded car, we wouldn't see Verstappen with such consistent results. I think if we fully wanted to understand this driver thing, we'd need a lot more information than we have access to with the fast F1 API. But in general, from what I've seen in these scenarios, the faster driver, Max in this case, is just more comfortable with a pointier car. As the team has developed the car and added performance, Max can take a little bit more front end, which means he's closer to the edge, but he's able to hold the car there on this limit and extract more from it more consistently. Now, at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that Verstappen has the chance to break two massive Formula One records. The first of these two records is Michael Schumacher's 13 wins in a season, which he achieved with the Ferrari in 2004. Of the 18 races in that season, Michael won 13 of them. The Ferrari F2004 was a pretty dominant car, but despite the RB18 not being the fastest car for most of the season, Verstappen looks like he's on course to be able to beat this record. Verstappen has won 11 of the 22 races so far, and he only needs three more to claim this record off of Michael. From what we've seen so far, this looks like an almost certainty for the season, but the next record to break is actually quite a bit more difficult. We're talking about Sebastian Vettel's nine in a row in the RB9. In 2013, Seb won every race from Belgium to the final race in Brazil that year. Currently, Max is on a five in a row, and he needs to win five of the remaining six races in order to take this insane record away from Sebastian. Now, if we looked at the qualifying performance alone all season, I don't think anybody would say that the RB18 was dominant. In terms of single lap raw pace, Ferrari has had the upper hand for most of the season, and from what we've seen, I think they still do. But we've got a nearly faultless Verstappen, a surgical Red Bull pit wall, and a very adaptable RB18, and they've made it seem like this championship is getting dominated. And honestly, Ferrari keep f***ing it up. I've left a few videos here on some topics that we've mentioned during the video. Be sure to check them out. Let me know what you think, and I will see you all after Singapore.